This episode is brought to you by Grasshopper. Stay connected and run your business from your mobile phone with Grasshopper. To save $50 on your order, visit trygrasshopper.com slash twip. If you're still stuck in Apple's aperture looking for a way out, consider taking the blue pill. Many Apple Aperture users are still lamenting the loss of their beloved app, holding on as tightly as they can, but knowing that eventually they will have to let go. Today's podcast isn't about helping you to decide where to go, but how to get there. Any decision you make will be a bitter pill to swallow, but to keep you out of the rabbit hole, may I recommend you take the blue pill. Aperture Exporter by Blue Pill Software is an app that does as the name implies. It exports from Aperture your original photos, adjusted photos, metadata, and more into a universal format that any app can read. No, your adjustments aren't coming along for the ride, but your adjusted images are. Join me and Adrian Graw of Blue Pill Software to learn all about Aperture Exporter. I'm Photo Joseph, and this is Twip Apps. Welcome back to Twip Apps. I'm your host, Photo Joseph, and today's guest is Adrian Graw with the company Blue Pill Software, who is here to talk about his app, Aperture Exporter. Adrian, welcome to the show. Hey, thank you, Joseph. It's great to have you on. So the name itself is fairly self-explanatory. We're exporting something from Aperture, but it's a little bit more than something. Tell us a bit about what your app does. Uh, Aperture Exporter uh, exports entire Aperture libraries to disk. Um, but it does more than that, of course, because in our Aperture library, we have things like ratings, a lot of metadata that we want to take along with it. Um, when I started Aperture Exporter it was when Apple announced that Aperture was being discontinued. And there were a lot of guides uh, all over the Internet about how to do it. Sure. Um, it was done manually. Um, and I thought there's got to be a way better way to do this. Um, so I started working on Aperture Exporter right then. Okay. That's interesting. For some reason, I thought that it had been around since before the demise of Aperture was announced. No, I was uh, I was actually at the cottage, at the family cottage when it happened. And uh, <laughs> I walked outside and started complaining. <laughs> <laughs> and the family said, what are you talking about? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Ah, yes, those days. Well, so then this is going to be an app that will be a very welcome tool for any Aperture users who either are still holding on to Aperture or still have libraries in Aperture that they haven't migrated over but want to. Yeah. Um, Again, it's probably the easiest way to go about it. Okay. Um, And with some care, most people get everything they want. Okay. Can't can't really... Go ahead. It can't really be all things to all people, but we, we try. Okay. So is it exclusively for exporting to a Lightroom library or can it be used for other apps as well? No, it, it can be used for any app. Um, what oh. Aperture Exporter does is creates XML sidecar files to carry the metadata. Mm-hmm. Um, it does that for all media types except for JPEGs. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, Lightroom, an Adobe product, and Adobe's are the it, the owners of the XML sidecar right. uh, format. They don't actually support importing metadata from those sidecars if you have JPEGs. They expect the metadata to be embedded in the JPEG, right? Correct. Okay. Okay, so you're exporting a sidecar to go along with every image. What about the adjustments that have been made to that image? Adjustments are uh, are not exported um, in a non-destructive way. So Sorry. the math between Aperture and Lightroom is so different. It, even if it was possible to extract it from Aperture, um, mm-hmm. it just the math wouldn't work. Sure. No, that's un- that's understandable. But are you going to get a rendered JPEG of the images that you've already adjusted? Yes, you can have rendered JPEGs of the images, or you could have TIFF files created. Oh, okay. So you can choose. That's great. 
Yeah, and and that's also done on a um, a star rating basis. So you could say from one to four stars, I just want JPEGs. For all my five stars, I want TIFFs. Oh, that's fantastic. Okay, that's very very useful. Yeah. Alrighty. So you're the process, and of course we're going to look at this in a moment and see it in in real time. But the basic process is you're going to take your Aperture library do some amount of cleanup or organization, which you're going to talk about to ensure that it's ready for export. You're exporting this out, and then you have something that can be imported into essentially anything that reads the XML. So Lightroom, uh, Capture One, I assume. What other apps yes. does it work with? Uh, we've had a, a giant list of, of uh, compatible apps. I don't have it in front of me. But basically anything that can import a file structure okay. um, is going to work. Okay. Well, that sounds pretty good. It sounds like an app that uh, that a lot of people are gonna going to want. Now, we know that uh, that Lightroom, for example, today does allow you to import an Aperture library, but we also know that it is limited. There are a lot of things that you lose in the process. Can you talk a bit about the advantages of using Aperture Exporter versus just going straight into Lightroom? Right. Probably the biggest issue with uh, Lightroom's importer is that the file structure it creates are a, a year, month, day hierarchy. So on the file system, you lose the organization that you provided in Aperture. Mm. Um, it does some things that try to mitigate it, but a lot of people don't find that sufficient. Sure. Um, the other thing is with the rendering. Uh, of adjustments. Uh, the the Aperture Importer uses the low quality pre-renders from Aperture itself. Right, the JPEG previews that were rendered. Right. Okay. So, you know, in contrast, Aperture Exporter uh, renders those out um, on demand okay. and at as high resolution as it can. Okay. All righty. And then yeah, the file structure, that's a big deal, obviously. So you're, at what level can you maintain from Aperture? You've, of course, in Aperture, you had folders, you have projects, and you have albums, and then you had smart albums, um, among right. other projects like books and cards and things like that. So what gets maintained, and what, if anything, gets lost? You can have everything. Really? Um, yeah, you can have your smart albums, your albums, um, your books. Um, now the books aren't the rendered books, but the images that are in the book, mm -hmm. um, the albums and smart albums are optional just because of the extra disc space it's going to take to, uh, write those copies out. So they get run out as a copy. Um, but what does get, uh, exported always are the folders, uh, projects, albums, Okay. Uh, sorry, not albums. The folders and projects. Folders and projects. Okay. So that's it's interesting you say that if you go into an album, it's making a copy. And this is one of the the big advantages of of Aperture. What it always had was this ability to take an image. So you've got a project with twenty images in it, and one image can go into twenty different albums, and it's not going right. to take any additional space. But for the export, you're saying that it does need to put a copy, a different copy, in each of those albums. Right. That is just one of the options. They, there's another option that will tag the the originals that um with a keyword that identifies all the albums it belongs to mm. okay so later in lightroom or whatever tool you decide to go to uh you can use you know leverage those keywords to make or recreate albums sure okay and just to, to be totally fair and upfront with the viewers about it this isn't necessarily a limitation in, in the code that you've written or the app that you do that you do it's a difference in the file structure between the apps and Lightroom just doesn't handle things the same way that's right yeah and, and there's only so much uh, you can work with uh, with the metadata structures yeah mm -hmm. the metadata just wasn't designed to carry things like adjustments originally right um, of course okay so some, some of that information I just can't get to. Right. No, fair enough. Fair enough. All righty. Well, we're going to take a look at it in a moment. Before we do, though, what is the cost of Aperture Exporter? 
It's nineteen ninety nine uh, mm. from the Mac App Store. Uh, it's also available uh, as a download from her website. Okay. Well, at nineteen ninety nine, I think that's a I think that's a fair bargain to manage to move your entire Aperture library over to another system. Uh, with, yeah, <laughs> some people think it's a great deal. Some people think it's too expensive. Um, <laughs> well, those people clearly you, have when not you look tried at doing the this amount manually. Of time it does save. Uh, yeah. If you were really to to reflect on that, I think you do find it's a good deal. Oh, I think it's a great deal. I would argue with anybody who says otherwise. That clearly, they haven't tried to move these over manually or seen what happens when you do use the uh, the default built-in aperture importer on Lightroom. Mm-hmm. So while well, the price is very fair, if anything, I would say you should raise your price, but uh, you can do that later. <laughs> <laughs> I like hearing that. <laughs> right on. All right, we're going to jump into the demo. Before we do, though, let's just take a quick break for a word from our sponsor. Hey, TWIP listeners. As you've probably heard by now, I'm running a workshop in Oaxaca, Mexico in January, and there's a few seats left, and I'd love if some of you could come along. Head over to photojoseph.com slash workshops where you can learn everything you need to know about it and hopefully sign up. With any luck, I'll see some of you in Mexico in January. This episode is brought to you by Grasshopper. Grasshopper is a virtual phone system designed for entrepreneurs. Grasshopper works just like a traditional phone system, but requires no hardware purchase or software installation. With their iOS and Android app, callers can reach you wherever you are on your mobile phone. Grasshopper allows you to keep your existing number so you can maintain your brand. Or when you make a call, your client can see your Grasshopper caller ID instead of your personal phone number. Simply select a toll-free or local number, record a custom greeting, and add multiple extensions for your business. Toll-free numbers are great for marketing and make your business sound more professional. You can set up department and employee extensions with custom call forwarding to any phone in the world. You can get voicemails emailed to you as audio attachments. And you can also send and receive text messages from your business number. Join the over 250,000 Grasshopper customers today. Plans start at just $12 a month, and you have a 30-day money-back guarantee. Turn your smartphone into a business line with Grasshopper. To save $50 on your order, go to trygrasshopper.com slash twip. That's trygrasshopper.com slash twip. And we thank Grasshopper for their support. And we're back with Adrian Gra of Blue Pill Software looking at his app, Aperture Exporter. Adrian, thanks for the introduction. It is now time to get into the meat of it and see what this app can do. So let's uh, jump over to your system here and show us what you got. All right. Um, So what I'm going to show here is just, you know, a typical user's uh, Aperture. Um, On the left, we see that there's some structure in, in their organization. Uh, there's ratings, um, there may be even some uh, albums. Uh, and here I have a few smart albums. And uh, we want to replicate this structure onto the file system for importing to another tool um, as accurately and with as much fidelity as possible. Um, there, Essentially, there isn't that much to set up here. Uh, all we need to ensure is that Aperture has loaded the library that you want to export and that Aperture is running. Okay. And then are there, is there any amount of cleanup that you want to do before you do this, going in and making sure that you do have things set up this way or don't have things that way? Is there anything like that that you really want to look at before you hit that big export button? There, there is uh, there is a caveat with Aperture Exporter in that it does not know if an image actually has uh, adjustments applied to it. Okay. So one thing that I recommend and is in various guides is that uh, you create a smart album um, that has um, all of your images that have no adjustments. Okay. And why, in that why don't you album, just open up the uh, the smart album setting there so people can see real quick sure. how that's set up? Sure. Uh, there's just one rule here, um, and you get this adjustments rule, and just say adjustments are not applied. Great. Um, it, that that is done through, you know, just add rule adjustments. Right, and it's the very first one there. So, okay. Yeah. yeah. Super easy. Smart super album easy. setup. Okay. Um, once you have once you have this, you can you know select all of your images, um, 
come over here to metadata and we are going to do a batch change and we're just going to add a keyword that says no adjustments okay and then this is something that aperture exporter will be looking for yeah uh, aperture exporter detects that keyword on any image and then okay. prevents a rendered jpeg or tiff okay from being created brilliant okay nice and easy right um the other thing you might want to consider if you if you do want uh albums exported um, is to get rid of any albums you don't really want sure for example if you, this uh you know one star or better smart album is going to have a lot of images right right so that could a take up a lot of time in in the export and b take up a lot of disk space so you sure. might consider just deleting any smart albums you don't need okay now smart albums exclusively or albums as well um if you have large albums that you're not too concerned of you can sure. um typically what we see um, from our customers is they run into trouble with the smart elms. They're the ones that tend to get really bloated. Right. Makes sense. Yeah. Cause you have a criteria like that one star better and it's virtually everything in your library. Yeah. Okay. All right. Fair enough. Okay. So let's go ahead and just fire up uh, aperture exporter. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm just going to hide aperture here. And we are going to just start Aperture Exporter. There we go. And <laughs> OK, I, I didn't install it in the Applications folder. It's offering to do that for me, and I don't think I need to do that. Um, so when you fire it up, it makes some initial communication with, uh, with Aperture, finds out the, uh, the library's name, you know, approximately how many images are in that library mm -hmm. and the estimated number of folders that would be created. Okay. And then we have another, a, a, a number of options of how the export's going to go. Okay. Let's uh, go through those. Sure. Uh, the, the, the first option is how are the file names going to be named? Uh, the default is that they are named to be to reflect the same name as the master mm -hmm. in Aperture. Um, but there are another a, a number of options. Uh, you can pull things from the version name. You can have a custom name. You can anything that you can configure as an export profile in Aperture will appear in this list. Okay, so this is pulling from the list of them in Aperture, the actual naming convention yeah. list in Aperture. Yep. Oh, that's yep. great. Okay. Yeah. Um, now, when I we, we talked earlier about uh, uh, about albums and smart albums, uh, mm -hmm. this is where uh, you can configure whether or not album albums will be exported and how. Sure. The, the first one is tells Aperture Exporter, yeah, go ahead, create, create a folder and populate it with all of the images that are in that folder. Mm -hmm. uh, the second one says, look at those albums, create a keyword that reflects that, that this picture is in an album or in multiple albums and tag the picture with it. Now, does it, how does it, build that keyword is it just going to be the name of the album or does it preface it with something like after it's album pre it's prefixed it's prefixed with the word album okay. space dash space and then the album name got it perfect right. that way people don't get confused if they had an album named birds and then uh, suddenly the, all, every picture gets a keyword that's just birds it doesn't necessarily mean it was in that album so that's great you're, you're prefixing it with the album word then perfect right all right. Um, the next uh, option that is is pretty commonly used is the tag faces with a keyword. Mm -hmm. And with this option, uh, Aperture Exporter goes through the images, 
dives actually directly into the database, pulls out any of the faces that are in uh, an image, and tags the image with all of the faces that are in that picture. Great. And obviously this is looking at Aperture's Faces database. It's not like it's magically naming people in your library. So this that, is assuming right. that you've been using Faces, that data will get carried over as keywords. Right. Super. Okay. Okay. Um, now the next block of options are to create the rendered versions of your images. Um, we'll just highlight here that the ignore images tagged with no adjustments keyword is Perfect. enabled. So Great. in a previous step, we had we looked at a smart album and we added that keyword. Mm -hmm. So this just makes sure that you recognize that we're not going to create uh, rendered versions of those images. Right. Makes sense. Very good. Right. And um, we have options to create JPEGs or TIFFs. Um, we're going to go from uh, you have the option to go from reject, which is this X, to zero stars. Um, so that's the starting rating. So mm -hmm. I'm going to select from reject to three stars. Okay. And I'm going to select, I'm going to leave it at default quality, which is probably around a nine if you're, if you're familiar with Aperture's exporting um, okay. quality settings. And then for the, the creating JPEGs, it says for images rated between, you've got it to reject up to three stars. I would imagine for most people, there's no reason if it's a reject, then you don't need it. And if even if it's a, well, I guess if it's a zero star, if you haven't rated it yet, if you have adjusted it, you want it. But I would think if it's a reject, mm -hmm. there's probably not really any benefit to rendering that. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So most so, people probably set it from zero to three stars or four stars and then four or five stars for, uh, for the TIFFs. Yeah. And the TIFFs that are being generated, see it just says create TIFFs. Is this an 18-bit or a 16-bit TIFF? So um, in the advanced options, there is there are uh, options to handle that. Uh -huh, perfect. Uh, by default, they're going to be 8-bit TIFFs. Okay. But you can create 16-bit TIFFs. Great. And I'm looking at some of the other options here. So, oh, different versions. Okay, so yeah, if you're handling versions that's an interesting first option there so if you have and for anybody who's forgotten or hasn't looked at aperture in a while you had the ability of course in there to create take a single image and make as many versions as you wanted so you could have your black and white version your crop square version you know whatever dozens of different ones so here you're saying that you can create a a rendered jpeg or tiff or whatever it is for each one of those versions or not is that what this is this is no saying? the rendered tiff or jpeg will be created for each and every version Okay. But the unread rendered master is what this is talking about. Oh, okay. So your unrendered master will by default only be exported once. Got it. Got it. Now, is there the, any, I guess this really isn't up to you, is it? This is more on the other end, but any correlation between this was the master and then here's 20 different versions of the same picture? No, there oh. there, there is no linking that way. It's not... This is, you know, the most important version. Right, right. So I guess the closest you would hope is is having similar file names. Um, yeah, and again, that's not anything you had anything to do with. That's just in Aperture, you could stack them, but I don't believe that metadata, that data was accessible, whether an image was no. stacked or not. No, right. that's not. Yeah, okay. Okay, so let's take a look at some of these other advanced options you have in here. Sure. Um, there are... An a number of issues that um, go along with exporting uh, file names and the way that uh, Lightroom in particular handles them for a lot of file names that are valid in Aperture mm. and perfectly valid on the, file, uh, on the Mac um, OS file system, Aperture will not import them. Lightroom. Uh, Lightroom, yeah. <laughs> Lightroom will not import them. So that's interesting. Uh, there's a bunch of file name uh, sanitizers that are going on here. Okay. Um, and they are actually uh, configurable, and they're made configurable for a number of kind of 
maybe not use fringe cases, but cases where people were very particular about how their na file names were, were being mm -hmm. generated. Now, what happens on the Lightroom side if you import a file name that has one of these illegal characters? Is it just going to refuse to import it or is it going to convert it on its own? Uh, it will not import it. Hmm, great. Handy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thanks, Adobe. <laughs> okay. All righty. And let's see what else is in here. Uh, the the uh, last uh, tab here is just for keywords. Uh, it gives you a bit of finer control over um, what Aperture Exporter will tag with keywords. Okay. Um, uh, an interesting one is, uh, you know, the for example the the color labels. Um, a lot of people use that in their workflow, and uh, w you know want to maintain that data somehow. So are the colors, if you give it a red color, purple color, whatever, is that not part of the XML to say that this file was labeled with this no. color? No, that really? is not. Yeah. Oh, I thought that that was. Okay. So if you've got a bunch of images tagged red, you're not going to see those show up as red in Lightroom or anywhere else unless you do this, which I, I assume is on by default, and then did a quick search in there for all images that were tagged that and then right. converted them or added the red label there. Okay. That's interesting. I, I actually thought that it was because I know that when you're in a uh, photo mechanic, which uses color labels quite heavily, you can do color labeling and then bring that over into Lightroom and that gets carried over. I believe what's happening there um, is that it's using the um, uh, the Mac OS metadata tags. So if you look mm. at through Finder, you, it will have a color label there as well. Oh, interesting. Is that not something that. you're you're able to do in here? Uh, it it is possible. It's just not been requested. Okay, fair enough. And this is a, a obviously very simple, easy workaround. I mean, the most you would have is what five or six colors, so it wouldn't take more than a few minutes to relabel everything inside of Lightroom, which just by creating a yeah. smart uh, smart collection in Lightroom, looking for that keyword and then slapping the color on it. Right, but okay. it brings up an interesting point. Um, Aperture Exporter really did evolve with the input of a lot of photographers. Okay, um, when. The, you know the first versions had uh, export uh, quality uh, for the rendering um, but a lot of features you see here are you know because people requested it okay that's great well it's always a, a nice thing for our users to hear when a developer tells us that a lot of the features are in here by user request that's that's comforting for users because quite often we spend our hard-earned money on these apps where the developer seems to just frankly not care what the user actually wants they're developing in a vacuum and it's uh, it's always refreshing to hear when a developer says that they are actually listening and including features that people are requesting yeah uh, no doubt i am listening uh the fact is that we haven't had any requests for quite some time, so the version we're on now is has actually aged pretty gracefully. Mm. Okay, fair enough. Fair enough. Well, maybe uh, I think with every major OS release, you know, as Aperture gets a little bit closer to that final death nail, that people, uh, you know, reconsider. Maybe it's time now to migrate over, uh, if that's what in fact they're going to do. So, excellent. Yeah. Alrighty. So yeah. let's see. Is there anything else in here we need to look at? Uh. The uh, the last you know thing for consideration is where you're going to export to. Mm -hmm. um, if you click along this uh, bar here, you can select any folder you want to okay. export to, whether that be in uh, on your internal drive. You can use an external drive if you like. Um, and I see it's giving us an ETA of how long it's going to take. Is there an estimate of how much disk space it's going to take? So you know if you're exporting a huge library, you don't run into yeah, a problem? Unfortunately, that is a really tough nut to crack mm. um, for a few reasons. Uh, the first is we don't know ahead of time how many uh, versions, uh, rendered versions we're going to make. Okay. And those can take up quite a bit of disk space. Sure. Um, okay. That is the, the biggest reason. Right.
I wonder uh, if you could you run a what would you call it uh, like a blind pass? I'm not sure what the right terminology would be, but essentially pretend you're doing the export but not actually do it just to make that count and say, okay, we're going to be generating 12,000 JPEGs and 6,000 TIFFs, and that's going to add up uh -huh. to roughly this kind of disk space. Yeah, it, it certainly could. Um, again, it... Not requested. <laughs> not requested. It, and it's also a tough thing to present to a user and it be wrong which right. inevitably the estimate is going to be wrong. So sure. if I said it's going to take four, you know, a, a, a terabyte and it mm -hmm. took two, the, my mailbox would get full. <laughs> okay. So oh. there goes the mic. Yeah. No worries. So, okay. You can, uh, you can't estimate the size for export. Then what do you generally advise people? So if I've got a one terabyte library, if you can make an assumption that the majority of the images are going to have JPEGs or TIFFs, and so it's obviously going to be bigger because it's not just the the originals, it's the originals plus these rendered files. Would you tell people double, triple your space? What's the general guideline? I would try to stay out of it. Um, <laughs> It, again, because it would inevitably be wrong. It, yeah, it really. Okay, well, know, what, how then many, let's how ask many the question five this stars way. do you have? Yeah, let's ask the question this way: What's going to happen if it runs out of space? Will it gracefully end, or it will, it will gracefully happen? end? It'll stop. Um, and then, can you pick up where you left off once you? And, go out and in that case, disk? yes, you you would uh, you would move to a larger drive, and mm -hmm. you could use this resume mode. Okay. And in this resume mode, uh, Aperture Exporter will detect all of the folders that have already been created and populated and okay. pick up from where it left off. Okay, great. Well, that's fair enough then. At least you have that, uh, that capability. Well, that and actually this came as a user request for someone who had a large export to do and they needed their machine that afternoon to go out on a shoot. And he said, do I have to start all over again? Gotcha. Hold on. And I, I <laughs> got him something in about an hour and he was happy. Well, that's, that's impressive. Can't expect that from Apple or Adobe, can you? No. <laughs> okay. All right. And then from there, you just click on export. So uh, I'm assuming we're not going to watch this export most likely. You probably have one that's already done. I, I have one that's done. Um, I'm just going to yeah, click uh, export here. I have it on resume mode. Okay. Um, it won't take long because most everything's already exported. Alrighty. And so while that's going, so we're exporting it to the desktop. We're actually, can you go ahead and open up that Aperture Exporter folder in the pictures folder just so we can Going see yep. kind of what's happening in here. So there we go. There's Aperture Exporter. Okay. So we're looking at folders like do projects, personal rejects. Yeah. Uh, studio. So just for comparison's sake, uh, mm -hmm. I'm going to pull up that, get back to Finder, and, oh, sorry, we want this, there we go, and. So those folders, are those top level folders in Aperture? Oh, I see, there's a personal yes, folder. Yes, they are. Okay. So um, here we have Dupe Projects, uh, Personal uh, Studio, it's working on right now. Mm-hmm. Um, so, and there are the images. We have some that are have TIFFs. We have the masters, um, XMP uh, sidecar files here. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, it's continuing to render out. So, that, again, that reflects the structure we have here in, in uh, Aperture. Great. So go back to the finder real quick. Let's see. All right. So there. So sure. we're looking at morning. So that's Studio A. There's the date, 2015-07-08, and then morning, and then the images inside of that. Uh, did you – you had it set to export albums. Can you drop down to the next folder, that 2016-06-01 or sorry, no, uh, the proposed collections? And right. Let's see what's happening in there. Sure. Um, we oh, it looks like it hasn't gotten there yet. gotten to that yet. Or have we? No. Nope. Okay. Hasn't. 
So that'll not, maybe okay. you have another one somewhere else. I just wanted to see in the Finder what people would see. Um, did you have that option enabled to export the albums? I don't remember how you had it set up inside of Aperture uh, Exporter. No, I did not. You didn't. Okay, so we're not going to see it there anyway. Okay, yeah. fair enough. So, but we would effectively we would just be seeing that we'd seeing a folder it would be there another for that folder album. populated with images. Okay, got it. Alrighty. Um, well, it's got an ETA of 35 minutes. I don't think we want to wait that long. Do you have no? A, <laughs> do you have a, another one that's all set and ready to go? We can take a look at that inside of Lightroom. Yep. Yeah, we can actually go ahead and start with it right now. Um, so in Lightroom, you'll pull up your import uh, dialog um, and mosey on over to uh, your pictures and wherever you did uh, export to. Uh, we don't want all photos here. We just want the the folder that Aperture Exporter exported to. And the biggest deal is that you want to make sure you are adding images to your catalog and not moving them. OK. Right? So that you have them in place. You're not using, again, more disk space. Right. Right, absolutely. And then this is because Lightroom is going to essentially mirror what's in the file structure that is in the Finder. That's what we're going to see in Lightroom. So it's, Lightroom's not going to be building collections at this point. It's just going to be in there in the under the Folders tab in Lightroom. We're going to see everything that was in the Finder just as it was. Well, just as it was in the Finder. That's what we're going to see inside yeah. of Lightroom. Okay. Exactly. All right, great. The other thing that we've run into, um, and uh, it's caused some issues with a few people during import, is that they had some sort of metadata preset being applied to their imported images. Okay. And the effect of that was it was overwriting uh, the metadata that Aperture Exporter put into the images. Right, that makes sense. So, okay. So you have to be very careful of how you use this metadata overriding. Right. So essentially, you don't really want to do anything here on the import. You don't want to, I mean, okay, you could build smart previews, but even the mm -hmm. not importing suspected duplicates might not be a good idea to turn on just because if it did actually find a duplicate, then that would no longer be in your file structure as you expect it to be just because it happened to be somewhere else in your in your Lightroom right. library. And, okay. and if you did export albums, oh, you, right. Absolutely. you don't know what's going to happen. You yeah. don't know if you're going to get the one that was in a... Um, in an album or the one that was in a project. Okay, so essentially when you're importing this Aperture exported collection of folders, then when you import this in Lightroom, make sure everything is turned off. Turn off metadata, turn off detect dupes, turn off all that stuff. Yeah. So I guess smart previews, you could enable that, but that's going to make for an awful lot of smart previews. So unless you really want to sync this whole thing to your iPad, then uh, it's probably no point in doing that. Right. Okay. Anything else on the import that we need to be aware of? No, that is, uh, that is the biggest concern. Okay. So add them, don't copy or move, and disable everything, everything on import other than potentially smart previews, but even that's probably a bad idea. So right. there you go. Okay. Then go ahead and hit import and wait. And wait. And wait. And so we can see over on the left there, we've got the catalog listing. That's the current import, and then underneath that folders, and that's where we're going to see the file structure completely recreated. Correct. Excellent. So there it is. Importing away. Okay. And uh, uh, now we're seeing one of my biggest pet peeves of Lightroom, where their use of negative space is horrendous, and <laughs> you're cutting massively cutting into the file name without making it incredibly wide. You know, I learned a yeah. trick uh, not too long ago. So you know how you just drag that wide, um, and you I, th I think you hit the wall. You drag it as wide as you can. Yep. If you hold down, I think it's the Option key, you can make it as big as you want. It's either Option huh. or Command. Give it a try. Yeah. Or <laughs> while we're. All right. Let's... Yeah, there's the wall. Oh, there yeah. Go. Look at that. So yeah, you can actually a... make that as big as you want, as ridiculous as that might be. Right. Oh, okay. So it's popped up enable reverse geocoding. So obviously that hadn't been turned on yet in Lightroom. Some of these images had GPS data embedded in them, uh, or presumably coming over from the, uh, from the places database and embedded into the sidecar file. Would that be? 
a good guess? Yes. Yeah. Um, actually, that's a, a great point. The uh, uh, Lightroom's importer tends to ignore geolocation that was added by Aperture's places feature. Okay. Um, Aperture Exporter, however, does grab that information, does put it in the metadata. Great. Great. Now, of course, the names aren't going to be there because that's what the reverse geocoding is. And that's up to, in this case, Lightroom to get that right. Lightroom's using a Google database, so it should be right, but mm -hmm. you never really know. Uh, but the GPS coordinates, those that's hard data, and that's going to be there. And so it'll show up in the right place on the map. Whether it gets called Eiffel Tower or not, that's up to Lightroom. Correct. Super. Okay. Awesome. And then once we're in here, as we had talked about before, if you had done something like labeled them with the color labels, then you could just build that smart collection inside of Lightroom and find those red or whatever pictures very quickly and slap a new label on. Right. Okay. Is there anything inside of Lightroom, now that we've seen the import, is there anything else we want to look at in here? I think it's pretty pretty straightforward. Uh, no, that's it's pretty straightforward. I think okay. uh, that's great. That covers it. Excellent. Well, before we move on, then, is there anything we've left out about Aperture Exporter? Uh, give it a try. Uh, <laughs> it, it may not be right for you, um, but if it is, uh, I think you'll be happy with it. Yeah. Well, yeah. And 20 bucks is definitely 20 bucks very well spent. And the just the potential of how much time it can save. Uh, to be able to get all these images over, get your file structure and get your rendered images. And I love that you can set up a, take your JPEGs and only TIFFs for a certain level of it. That's really cool. Right. And, and that's said, just one of the things you couldn't do by hand in a, right. you know, in a reasonable amount of time. Yeah, you know, it would be a nightmare. And I know I, I had asked and you opened it up. I don't think we actually looked at it, but it was in the advanced settings. You can choose between eight or 16 bit TIFF. Was that right? Yes. Okay, great. Super. Well, thank you very much for that, Adrian. Appreciate that. So that brings us to the end of our demo part of the show, which moves us into the guest app pick part of the show. So regular viewers will know that in this portion of the show, we ask our guest to pick one of their favorite photo-related apps on any platform. It could be Mac, Windows, iOS, or Android. And the only caveat is it can't be their own. So Adrian, what have you got for us? I picked uh, thumb, Thumbs Plus Pro by Curious Software. Okay. Uh, it is a, a Windows application and was the first digital asset manage, manager I had ever used. Really? Uh, yeah. This is back in, I think, about 2000. It was, it, uh, it was my first experience with it, and I had used it for years until I moved to the Mac. Okay. It... Uh, it's has all of the features that light uh, Lightroom has already, and uh, in some ways, uh, for some people, especially if you have multiple uh, photographers sharing a database, uh, it, I would consider this a superior solution. No kidding. As it can be you can have a SQL backend. Oh, and have well, multiple that, clients connecting to that back end at the same time. Well, that is definitely one of the big missing things in Lightroom and something that people were asking for for Aperture for many years. Interesting. So simple database manager. Huh. Well, it's worth yeah. checking out. And it's a, I'd say it's yeah, a bummer that it's it only for Windows. Huh. Too bad that's not showing up on the Mac. Is there, do you know if there's some limitation of why they haven't released it on the Mac? Is it some back end thing that you just can't do it on the Mac? Or I... I couldn't tell you. Hmm. Interesting. I'll have to look at I'd this like a little bit more. I'd like to see it come to the Mac, though. I sure. Really would. Sure. I've never uh, never heard of this before, so I'll check it out. And it looks like they're doing updates. Their most recent update was from July of this year, so yeah. they are actively developing. Super. Well, thanks for that. Yeah. That's good. We don't often right. hear about something completely new that I haven't heard of before on the show, so thanks for bringing that to our attention. I had to scratch my head trying to figure out something you would not have heard of. <laughs> you, you succeeded. You succeeded. Uh -huh. Thanks. Appreciate that. Right on. Well, where can our guests learn more about Aperture Exporter? And, uh, of course, where can they get it? Uh, you can learn about it and get it from ApertureExporter.com. Uh, it's available from the Mac App Store or as a download from their website. Uh, your initial download, you could use it in trial mode. Uh, it'll create your full um, hierarchy and populate every folder with up to five images. 
Oh, okay. That's great. So that's how you handle a trial. And that, of course, would be just directly from your website since the App Store doesn't allow trial versions. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So you can get your entire folder structure exported. So you can see what the folder structure would actually look like, but you just have a few images, five images in each folder. Right. Yeah. That's that's a really good way to handle the trial. I was thinking about that when you were demoing. And I, yeah, what's the trial? Is there going to be a trial on this? So that's great. I'm glad you brought that up. Awesome. Right. And uh, you've got a couple of other apps, uh, links in here that you in the show notes that you wanted to mention, I think. Uh, yeah. If you go to apertureexporter.com slash TWIP apps, um, I have a special for TWIP apps listeners. Oh, well, thank you. Um, you can uh, name your price for the application. No kidding. Well, that's awfully yeah. kind of you. Let's just pull that up over here, switch over and show that screen real quick. Okay. Look at that, TWIP app special, name your own price. Man, that is, uh, that's very generous of you. Well, hopefully we'll have some users who will decide to name a price that's even higher than the $20, because <laughs> I do think that this is well worth a lot more than that. Um, it, the amount of time that this could potentially save is just enormous. So for those who are serious about moving to something else from Aperture, this is uh, this clearly could save a lot of time. So thank you for that. That's that's really cool. And what's, yeah. there's one more uh, link on here. Uh, yeah, the the next link is for a beta version of something I've been using regularly for the last few months, and um, it's called No Sleep Till. Okay. Um, and it's just a small utility sits in your menu bar and allows you to control when you when your Mac is allowed to sleep. Ah, okay. Um, I use this. I, I, I typically like my Mac going to sleep after half an hour or 45 minutes, but there are certain times during the day I do not do not want that to happen. Mm -hmm. I could be doing some batch processing. Um, and with this tool, I go up in the menu bar. I can set a schedule. You can nice. set, uh, set it to uh, prevent sleep for the next half hour 45 minutes hours as you and uh, as whatever you want sure very handy i like it yeah that's good i've actually found i i yet to understand why this has happened but i found occasionally when uploading things to amazon s3 if the computer not goes to sleep it's just the screen it goes into screen saver mode whatever like it stops the upload or it slows it down uh -huh. dramatically I'm going, what the heck so that's great i will uh, i'll download it myself and give it a go so yeah we, we yeah. push a lot of files around give it a here, try so. let me know what yeah. you like, what you don't like, and uh, I'll fix it. I will it. do that. I will do that. Excellent. Well, thank you again very much, Adrian. Uh, is there? Do you have a Twitter account that you want people to follow? Oh, I think I'd get in too much trouble if I use Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe you should run for office then. All righty, <laughs> we're going to drop it. We're going to leave it at that. Thank you very much, Adrian, for coming on. Appreciate it. This is uh, this is great. It's good to see, and uh, I know that our. We'll have a lot of viewers who will be very happy to hear about this and grab it. And like I said, hopefully viewers, come on, do me a solid here. Pay the man more than he's asking for for this this software because it's definitely worth it. Thanks oh, thank a lot. You, okay, Joseph. absolutely. All righty. Uh, thank you. And we'll talk to you later on. All right. Bye, everyone. All right. Bye-bye. All right, folks. So there you have it. That was Aperture Exporter by Blue Pill Software from Adrian. Adrian, thank you very much for coming on and showing that to us. This is a solid app. You know, it's it's simple, straightforward. It does what it says on the tin. This is nothing fancy. It's just about getting your images from Aperture over to another platform. And I like that this isn't exclusively for Lightroom. It is just creating a list, a folder collection of all of the, uh, all the photos that you have in your library. And, you know, sometimes you don't need anything fancy. You just need that raw data in there. And that's what this is giving you. And then it's up to the app on the other end to do something intelligent with it. So as we saw, you can easily import it into Lightroom. And as Adrian said, it'll work with a whole list of other apps. We'll have to get that list of apps for him and put it in the show notes because I think it's useful to be able to look at that and see exactly uh, if the app that you're trying to use is going to bring that over. I love that you can choose whether you want your uh, your images to be JPEG or TIFF and even up to 16-bit TIFF. And the way of separating them out, saying three star or above, is uh, very, very useful as well. It might be nice, and and you know, Adrian's already told us that people, people are getting the features that they're asking for. So I guess nobody's really asking for these things. But it might be nice to see the ability to define that based off of a keyword or off a color label to say anything that's got a red color label or as a keyword, make it big, is going to get exported as that TIFF file, just if you want a little bit more granularity in there. But I think what he's got here is uh, it's obviously working for 
the vast majority of users since uh, since that's what people are using today and not asking for different. He said it hasn't been updated in a while just because people aren't asking for changes. And as long as it works, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. So overall, great app, solid app, very, very affordable price. If you buy for any reason, think that it's not worth that, then uh, clearly you haven't tried to move a robust Aperture library over to anything else. So um, give it a try and it's great. You can get the free trial that will just export your entire folder structure and only put a couple of images in each folder so you can see exactly what it's going to look like. You can even take that all the way through to completion, take it into Lightroom, into Capture One, wherever you're going to go and see exactly how it looks there. So give it a go. Well, that brings us to the end of another episode of Twip Apps. I'm your host, Photo Joseph, and you can find me online at Photo Joseph pretty much everywhere. Also at my website, photoapps.expert, so do be sure to check those out. Also be sure to follow us on Twitter and Facebook and to visit our website at uh, thisweekinphoto.com or simply go to twipapps.com to go straight to our webpage here. And on there, you can sign up for our email list and uh, to be notified of new episodes and to get exclusive subscriber bonuses. If you're watching this on YouTube, be sure to comment, like, and subscribe. And if you're watching on our website, you can subscribe to the show using the subscribe box on this page. If you have feedback, suggestions, or comments about the show, you can reach me, Photo Joseph, directly by using our contact form. Just click on the Contact Us menu item at the top of the page. And finally, if you're a developer and would like to be a guest on the Twip App Show, hit that same Contact Us button and let us know what you got. We're always looking for new and interesting and exciting guests to bring onto the show. So please reach out to us. So with that, it is time to put your lens cap back on and go edit some photos. <music> <laughs>